Live from Fairfax, it's the Inside Scoop, Virginia. All the news Virginians want to know. Here's your host. Welcome to the Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is Shannon Sullivan, your host this evening. We have a little bit of a buffet of labor issues for you. We're going to be talking about some local events in Fairfax County and throughout the metropolitan Washington area, and also do some dabbling once again into federal labor law. We're going to be talking about the Employee Free Choice Act, a fundamental piece of labor law that's going to be reforming 70 years of broken policies and maybe we can do a little corrections to the Bush administration as well. I have with me Eamon Clifford, who's an organizer with the Op International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 99, and Sean Linehan, who is the president of the Communication Workers, uh, Local 2252. Thank, Thank you, you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's dive right in. Eamon, you have uh, kind of a sensitive uh, issue that's arisen in uh, Reston. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, for almost 30 years, we've represented about 14 or 15 workers that were involved in maintenance and uh, facilities management at the USGS, the United States Geological mm -hmm. Survey in Reston. And at the first of this year, a new contractor came in, NVE uh, Incorporated, and their subcontractor, uh, Complete Building Services, who we have a, a long history with. It's, uh, mm -hmm. they, they've been in and around DC for as long as we've been a union, and they're not, they don't have one union site. And they really made it clear that they don't want to be a union company. They oh, you're in, being nice. Uh, what, what else do we call them now? I, I, I call them Complete Building Services because that's the name of the company. Sean, what do we call such companies? I would call them Union Busting Companies. All right. On with the rest of the story. So this Union Busting Company, uh, who is acting as a uh, uh, subcontractor for NVE Incorporated, took over the contract on the first of the year and offered none of the employees, initially offered none of the employees uh, continued employment, and then oh. later offered two of them continued employment. Uh, this actually wouldn't have been legal to do two or three years ago. The Bush administration made some changes to the Service Contract Act that allowed you to do that. Previously, you would have had to interview everybody and make conditional offers of employment, provided there wasn't something that was uh, greatly outstanding mm -hmm. that would prohibit them from continued employment. Uh, 120 years worth of, of service to that building, to the facility wow. at USGS, uh, was lost when they displace these workers. Uh, now you said there's a unit totally of 16 workers? 16 they workers. they fired all but two? All but two. Can two people actually maintain the building by themselves? No, they brought in their own workers oh. to replace oh. them. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a pending unfair labor practice against them with the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, we feel strongly that their rights were violated under Section 7 of the Act. And we expect and we hope to have uh, the workers with conditional offers of back to work and uh, have the union back soon at USGS. We've gotten a lot of support from the local labor community and mm -hmm. uh, from the workers inside the USGS who, like I said, after 120 years of service, they know all the people there. and They did a great job running that building. Wow. So basically, if we were to go back to the, the Bush administration, all of this would have been illegal, what they did? or It, it would have been, been illegal. Okay. Three or four years ago, that would have been illegal. And it had been that way since uh. the beginning of, uh, of the uh, Service Contract Act. Okay. It was amended. It could be amended again. But uh, President Obama, one of the first things he did was change the act back to the way it was before. Now you'd have to make a conditional offer of employment to people, provided that they met the minimum qualifications. Certainly somebody's been working in a building that long, licensed engineer would meet the mm -hmm. minimum qualifications. I mean, I would think, you know, and we're also in an era where, you know, subcontracting and contracting out is almost the, you know, the, the new wave of the way to do business in a lot of our local governments and, sure. you know, corporations. But what you're bringing up is the actual quality of services that people are able to provide with their experience primarily. Right. Um, and that, you know, that needs to be taken into consideration. Well, and they had a, a, a union contract, a collective bargaining agreement in place, mm. been in place for some time. Now the new workers didn't come in working under that contract. They came in working under a bid, which was bid at uh, area wage determination, significantly lower. Lower. Significantly. So this wasn't at the expiration of the contract? It was the expiration of the okay, contract. Okay, when they uh, changed it over. On, on the first of the year, the new mm. company took it over and immediately displaced the, these workers. Man. 
Yeah, it's really a bad deal. It's a really transparent union busting effort. It's almost no question about it. It's not a very good way to do business locally, as far as you know, maintaining you know good public relations, you know, with your community, with with the building, with the federal government as a whole. And I would think that they'd want to take that into consideration as well. Well, without having to get too far afield, uh, it's pretty trans It's pretty clear to everybody that a lot of companies that wouldn't have mm -hmm. done this in another era feel in, empowered and emboldened by the last eight years of, uh, of uh, open shop union busting. Yep. They feel empowered by it, and it's a continuation of policies going all the way back to the Reagan era. Well, and I think you touched upon the only recourse right now is to file, file an unfair labor practice. Well, let's see, there's how many members on the National Labor Relations Board right now? There are two. Two out of five? There are two out of five, and, and they're operating under status quo, meaning anything that they made a decision of previously, that's how they'll decide again. Mm -hmm. so, so you're yeah. going to get something actually resolved within maybe the next four years. Well, if we get something resolved at the local level, and, and this region is a well-won mm -hmm. region, Region 5 has been fair to us, we think, for the most part, but if it's resolved, they certainly have the right to appeal it. If they appeal it up, mm -hmm. then yeah, who knows? You know, we, we have high hopes that President Obama will appoint a full board and we'll get, start getting some better decisions coming out of the board. Well, I think the point we're both trying to make in a roundabout way is there is no recourse for expeditious action. There's two members, they're relying on precedent, so to actually have a fair judgment to workers that have been dismissed, and a lot of times there's criminal actions that need to be you know, addressed. You know, sometimes people are working without any wages, they're unemployed, and they need those back pay. Well, that's exactly right. And it, 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 funny you mentioned back pay. That's the only way that a worker is made whole. Mm -hmm. If you're laid off or you're fired and nine months later the board says it was an unfair firing, yeah. and, and, and that's being, Charitable. In yeah. nine months is certainly within the realm of possibility. We've had people come back after a year, and the board does their best. And I don't want to put down the agents, the board, but they do their job, and they do it in a manner that that they're understaffed and overworked. And nine months or a year later, they get their, they get. It's found that that they were fired improperly. Almost never will you see that worker come back to work. He may be made whole by giving his money, but if he's been working another job, if he was making $22 an hour and went to work for $14 an hour, the employer only owes him $8 an hour for the time that he wasn't working. Well, and you're, I think you're being generous that someone is ever made whole. I well, mean, they and have been exactly wronged. Right. And normally, almost always, they then will make some kind of settlement offer because they don't mm -hmm. want that person coming back. Yeah. Because they've lost, and everybody will know they've lost. And then the union wins. And they can't have that, which, which goes another step to show that it's not even about money. It's about mm -hmm. power. It's about control. And, and it, it speaks to uh, the dehumanizing effect of union busting currently. I think, so. I think we're going to touch upon this when it comes to the organizing, to the contract and the Absolutely. bargaining session. It's not about the monetary value attached to a penalty. It's the way they go about, you know, intimidating the workers, trying to attack the union in a roundabout way, because a person will never be made whole. No. You know, they'll get what? Their back pay minus interim earnings. And if it's in the case of an organizing drive, you have just fired your, your leader, you know, your committee head, and pretty much squash any potential organizing movement. Right, and you've destroyed what's what the are recourse? laboratory conditions. It, it is almost impossible to run a fair union election with a predatory employer. Oh, it's, absolutely. It, it's almost impossible. You'd actually have to have, you'd have to have 100% of the people coming out of a union shop and with you to be, to be able to do that. The, the cards are so, so deeply stacked against workers. Right they're now. very strategic in the way they go about it. Absolutely. They know what they're going to do. It's a cost benefit analysis. It is. Okay, well, we're going to go to court maybe three to five years later, we're going to owe someone back pay. In the meantime, this person that has stuck their neck out, you know, for the union, whether it's organizing, it's a contract, whatever the situation is, is out of work, you know, may remain out of work for a long period oh, of time. And, that, and, you know, and, you know, the blackballing, which is also illegal, is rampant. We know that if somebody... We know it's all illegal. We, if somebody's <laughs> fired for organizing or fired for, as part of retribution, mm -hmm. if they're already under a collective bargaining agreement for standing up for the union and pushing the pushing the contract, if they're fired, and they go to another one of the big employers, it's very likely that the other employer will know, well, this, this, you know, mm -hmm. this guy's a union troublemaker and I don't want him in my shop. 
Absolutely. That's illegal. It happens every day. I know, Sean, we're going to touch upon some of your contract negotiations in our next segment. Have you had any similar experiences when it comes to organizing in some I of these? I did not want to break in, but no, yeah, we've right had ahead. the same type of things. And, and like you say, the, the, the problem is that, okay, you're, it's illegal. You get them and you get your decision, you say nine months, I'll mm -hmm. say two or three years sometimes down the road. In the interim, they've had some, they've tried to make some, or they've lost everything. I uh, have one particular person that was fired and, and had some health issues on the side and lost her home, lost everything, yeah. and went to decision and we were proved right and they got their money, but by the same token, the, the amount of time it took, the toll it took on the families and the toll it took on their, their you know, they lost their house, their families, their, their neighbors, it's, it's, it's devastating and uh, I would like to see that Hopefully someday those things will change and we can make some positive difference and positive change. But yeah, the, it, it's, the you never, you're never made whole. You're, you yeah, will never get, you'll never be made whole. You'll never, you'll never get that time back, you'll, that mm -hmm. pain and suffering that you've incurred. It, it, there's some justification and there's a feeling that you were right and it's nice to know that you were right. But by the same token, it, it, is, a, it is quite a struggle and for the family and everybody else involved. Well, and when so. we talk about it, uh, uh, making a worker whole, you know, that they can write this money off. Mm -hmm. This is a loss for them. They, they never actually pay anything. There's no teeth nope. to the law, and there's no punitive damages on the truck. I know. They well, write it right off on the other end, and it's like nothing happened. Let's take a two cents from a couple. Actually, we have a whole bunch of callers coming in. Let's do the first one. We have Shannon from Rockville. Uh, what's your question, Shannon? Hi. My question is this. How is all of this going to affect the Employee Free Choice Act we've been hearing so much about? Wow, Shannon. I think <laughs> <laughs> how do we want to tackle all of that? In a roundabout way, we've been using our, our local examples. Um, let's start from the Employee Free Choice does three things. Uh, the first one goes toward union organizing. If someone wants to organize a union for the first time, it makes it so the actual workers have the choice by the method they want to join the union. They can either go through the election process, referred to as the secret ballot, or they can go through the process of majority sign-up. Um, now, a lot's been made of trying to get rid of the secret ballot, it being undemocratic. Um, let me let you know, pure and simple, that is uh, misinformation. Um, allowing the workers, not the employers, the choice in which method they want to go through is the most and absolutely most democratic method. It makes it so if a majority plus one, you got 51 percent of workers want the union, they sign what we call union authorization cards and you have the union. What it does, you know, by way of our examples, is it takes the lawyers, it takes the courts, you know, out of the process. It shortens the time period. So if a worker wants to join the union, which is your fundamental right to self-organization, you should have that right. And you should be able to then go on to bargain your contract. You shouldn't have the employer say, nah, let's drag it out. Let's question the legitimacy of everyone that's ever signed a card, as though you're not in your right mind. That's the first step in what the Employee Free Choice does. There's two other segments that'll attack um, collective bargaining and also some of the punitive damages we were talking about. So I think we're going to go into Sean's example with his uh, local um, contract right now and then get some more employee free choice examples for you. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact C. Fripp at AOL.com.
giddy, giddy. You'd think it would be easy to tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems, and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is Shannon Sullivan, your host this evening, and we are tackling quite a few local labor issues and also juxtaposing that against uh, a federal piece of legislation, the Employee Free Choice Act. And our purpose tonight is to set those examples on the reality on the ground when it comes to organizing, when it comes to collective bargaining, and how it is fundamentally necessary that there is change to federal labor law as we know it. The system is broken. It is an unfair relationship, an unbalanced relationship between corporations and the unions. I have with me two guests. I have Eamon Clifford with the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 99, and Sean Linehan, the President of the Communication Workers of America, Local 2252. Um, and I want to thank Shannon from Rockville for her question on the Employee Free Choice Act. And we actually had Caroline from Great Falls who was going to ask the same question. I hope I tackled the first portion, which was uh, what the Employee Free Choice does by way of organizing. And I want to set it, uh, give it to Sean so he can set the stage for collective bargaining and how we might improve labor law. Um, for us right now, mm -hmm. uh, if you listen to President Obama's speech the other day, um, right now we're trying to economic, stimu economic stimulus. Mm -hmm. We're trying to grow. Uh, we're trying to put money back into the workers' hands, back into workers' pockets. Um, and, and that's basically fits right in. The, if, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but if you look at what, if there is a union and if there is union workers, it drives up the economy of everybody in the surrounding, not just the union members, but all the surrounding communities brings up the levels of everybody. Uh, and that's what we're, uh, unions are all about. It's not just fixing, taking care of our own. It's to bring up the standard of living of all the workers in the, in the town, in the neighborhoods, uh, bring them all up and help the community as a whole grow and, and move yeah, forward. Absolutely. It is the vehicle, and it always has been throughout whatever your industrialized nation, you know, the vehicle for self mobilization, you know, into the middle class for yourself and the family. Well, <laughs> it's amazing that if you look at the, at the post World War II economies that the United States were so involved in building in what they call old Europe. Mm -hmm. They made the labor movement the center of, of, of rebuilding <laughs> those economies. I mean, who knows exactly. more about rebuilding an economy but workers? And, and you know, Apparently that was good for them, but no longer good for us. And we're spreading democracy throughout the world, and yet we deprive one of the most fundamental elements of self-organization to our own workers. E exactly. Exactly. So. The, the company has it all over. I mean, if you're, if you're just an employee by yourself, you have no voice, you have no say in your working conditions, you have no say in your pay, you have no say in... And, and all the union does is give you a voice, and, and that's what we're attempting to do, and that's the, well, what sure. we've done since the 50s and... You know, I play a poor devil's advocate, but there's the people out there that say the unions had their place in time. You know, uh, they established the 40-hour work week. Great. You know, we enjoy our work, our weekends. We like our overtime. You know, child labor wasn't such a great thing. Good thing for the unions to take action there. How do you approach those critics that say the unions really aren't as pertinent as they used to be? Uh, I would... My own personal is, uh, yes, the unions have made progressive labor law. Uh, we've eliminated the child, and you're right, those things are 40 years ago. What have you done for me lately? Um, if you look at where we're at, though, I mean, I personally don't feel that there's any, if you, what happened at Enron? Mm -hmm. Was that a union company? No, it was not. Was what happened at MCI? Uh, these were union busting companies basically done with greed. They were handled with greed. Their CEOs ran their companies with greed, promoted themselves. Um, the, uh, 
I use the word gentleman, but I don't think he's a gentleman uh, from New York who's now in house arrest in his penthouse. Um, this is the type of mentality that runs corporations. Uh, not all corporations, but, uh, and, and all we're trying to do is they have the money, they have the power, and uh, a union, uh, true right now, we don't have labor law for, you don't have children doing that type of stuff. Uh, but who knows what's gonna come in the future? Who knows what's, um, you know, we had work going overseas. Uh, we had workers that were doing work here uh, at AT&T. They were taking phone calls. Um, that work went overseas to India. Uh, anybody who's um, had a problem with their phone uh, or had a problem with a piece of equipment and then you're, you're trying to call to get technical support mm -hmm. and now you're dealing with someone who may or may not even speak the same language and it's, there's communication issues and the quality of service uh, has gone down. And, and, and it's and it's it hurts the consumer. It hurts the people. And I'm not you know uh, nothing against those people in those uh, countries or, or where they're at. But um, yeah, you know if they were the paid, point. If, it's in, outsourcing exactly. because you want to pay less because you don't want to have to have considerations over environmental law, labor law. You know all the well, exactly health and right. safety, the working conditions. It's oh I can pay someone less and let's forget about because I know we've done a couple shows on it public safety. We've outsourced a lot of the operations for the gas lines. Have you seen, and it, it just, the, uh, I forget the name of the river, but it was in China, where they have all the computers. The Yangtze. And it, they're all just along the river, and it's polluting the rivers, which pollutes, I mean, how long is this going to go on? But someone is making a buck off of it. Oh yeah, that's all it is. It's someone's making a buck, and that's a dump, but it's, it's just one world. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a matter of time till it gets to you, and gets to me, and gets to my children, or my grandchildren, or my great-grandchildren. I mean, it's when does it end? The, 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 the source for just a buck. We're supposed to be here not just to make a buck, make it the rich richer. We're supposed yeah. to help others and help, help our neighbors. And If I can digress a little bit, you said you spoke to the thing that we hear over and over again as trade unionists that, well, unions were great. My grandfather worked in a coal mine, but that was then. And, and now the nature of work in America is such that we don't really need a, a third party or an advocate for workers. And, and it, if someone says that right away, you know, they haven't done a whole lot of work in a long time because almost everything you talk about, the 40-hour work week is being rolled back. People are being asked to work. Well, just tackle the mine hours. issues. The Bush administration well, exactly. didn't uphold basic mine, mine safety, safety standards but and didn't even follow through with basic penalties when they knew people were in a precarious position in their very own jobs. Well, that's exactly right. But, but that argument becomes even more scurrilous. And some of the people who put it out all the time, people from the Heritage Foundation, they, they say this routinely at these luncheons and why. If you repeat it enough, it makes it and true. It's funny because one of the things that they said recently was, well, now that we have OSHA and such strong, uh, uh, you know, workplace safety <laughs> laws, it's almost, it's almost not necessary to have a union any longer. And at the same time, you can go on their website, they talk about getting rid of OSHA. Well, let's staff OSHA, actually give them the tools to do I, their job. Well, sure, I'm not putting it off on OSHA. I'm only saying that, 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 that they're, they're saying, on one hand, that, mm -hmm. that OSHA is the answer. And on the other hand, they're saying, get rid of OSHA. It, it, it's, it's handicapping business. Well, I, w I would have to say that OSHA, and, and I'm a firm supporter of OSHA, but I would like it if they had some more teeth. Right. Uh, if, you, if, if you're found to be in violation of safety, then you should be held, as opposed to just slapped on the wrist and say, oh, go ahead and fix it. Um, so yes, so I would- Another I would, one of those cost benefit exactly. analysis. They're still gonna keep on doing it if there's not gonna be the penalties, which make them think twice about cutting all the safety and the health standards. Let's go into your local contract. We have a couple more minutes before the break. Uh, I work for AT&T. We represent um, AT&T, the core workers uh, in my particular local, um, what used to be considered AT&T national. Uh, as I stated earlier, President Obama made the comment that we're trying to stimulate the economy, bring the workers' salaries up. Uh, for those companies that were run badly uh, or, were, are, or are in trouble, such as the auto workers, um, they have separate issues. Uh, for us at AT&T, AT&T is an extremely profitable company. Uh, they made $13.4 billion in profits last year. Uh, they paid out $9.6 billion in dividends. Um, the CEO, Randall Stevenson, uh, total package last year was about $25 million for him personally. They are positioned well, their technology, they are, they are moving forward. Um, 
and we want to move forward with them. We want to continue to grow with AT&T. We're not trying to deny anybody the profits. Anybody, we want it to be a profitable company. Uh, by the same token, uh, we're going into negotiations and we want to participate. We've been there uh, for 100 years. Uh, we want to continue to grow. I want my, my children, my grandchildren to have a decent place to work and we want it to grow forward and we want our share of that. Uh, we, I have no problem with him making $25 million and if he can, that's fine. Uh, but part of the work that I do got him his $25 million mm -hmm. and I would just like my small portion um, and I would, we generated $13.4 billion in profits and I would like my portion of that to continue in job security and move forward and c continue to grow with the company. Absolutely. I mean, there's on one hand the issue of fairness. You know, not everyone likes the term spread the wealth. I happen to think it's a completely just, you know, statement that should be said more often. Um, but there's also the issue that, as you pointed out, these are the people that have built the company, stayed with the company, and their expertise is the one or one of the main reasons that it is so profitable and that that needs to be recognized because they are contributing. This doesn't need to be a contentious relationship between, you know, management and the union. Right. You know, let's work together and reward, you know, the due service that people are providing. Uh, I would, you know, to, to piggyback on what you had said earlier, back when there were child, there were no child labor laws, mm -hmm. there were baseball bats and people being killed on picket lines and, and people have yeah. died to get us where we are today. I would like to think that we have all progressed as a uh, the human race and we've moved forward and um, I th I hesitant to say but I, I hope in my heart of hearts that the companies realize that the union is not the enemy we are trying to I mean if the company does not make money and the company is not profitable we don't have jobs I mean it's just common sense we're not trying to bankrupt the company we're not trying and I'm not trying you know if Randall Stevenson needs $25 million to put food on his table, then that's fine. Uh, I don't need $25 million. Um, I need substantially less than that. But by the same token, um, I see no reason to be uh, destitute either. And um, we're making a profitable company and we're contributing to it and just our fair share of it. Uh, so we can continue to grow and I, it'll continue to be a good place to work. And, proud to work there and continue to be proud to work there. No one wants to be taken advantage of and, and victimized. That does not make for good employees, it does not make for good business. I think Sean has uh, summarized the issue quite eloquently, that unions and management, it does not need to be a contentious relationship. We can work for the profitability of a company as a whole. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One and some and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about drink that money. Nothing very nice. My whole is mine. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Yeah. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go! Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow! Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People! The flood is imminent! Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first.
Welcome back to the Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is Shannon Sullivan, and we have been talking about some local labor issues today. And just wanted to let you know, if you didn't already know, that union members actually earn 30% higher wages. They're 62% more likely to have employer-provided health insurance and four times more likely to have a defined pension plan. So we're talking about unions as a mechanism, a vehicle, however you want to put it, um, to put people in a stable position, the middle class, to be able to provide for themselves and for their families. I have with me Eamon Clifford with International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 99, and Sean Linehan, who's with the Communication Workers of America, President, Local 2252. Um, Sean, we were talking about your um, current contract negotiations right now with AT&T. Uh, they're a very profitable company. Yes, it is. Uh, the other interesting thing is, um, for those of you who have been around, uh, we're actually almost going back to pre-divestiture, or pre-1984 in that AT&T bought, uh, AT the breakup of AT&T, AT&T is now the former SBC, the former Bell South, the former Pac Bell, the former Ameritech, uh, and what was once singular. Um, all of these contracts are going on right now. Uh, interestingly enough, the Bell South contract did not expire till August, but um, with the union and mm -hmm. AT&T, we've decided to start early and we're the uh, majority, actually all of the contracts except Bell South expire uh, April 4th, uh, with the exception of the mobility, which expired February 7th. Um, yeah. And I would ask that uh, any of the viewers out there, uh, if you go by an AT&T store, uh, those, those contentions, uh, those negotiations are contentious. Uh, they are not going well. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of problems, um, and and we we have a lot of issues to work out. They were recently unionized. Uh, the contract that I have uh, at AT and T Core is several hundred pages thick. The AT and T Mobility contract is a pamphlet of about Ooh. twenty pages, um, and they they have a lot of things to work on and to work out uh, between the company and the union and. Um, they have been working very hard to do that, uh, but thus far have not been successful. How many workers are we talking about? That is a good question. Uh, AT&T Core, when I started in 1980, had 100,000 100, mm -hmm. occupational employees. Uh, we are down to 10,000. They've laid off uh, the other 90,000 people or retired. Uh, now that we're all, we're about 300,000 between all of the different entities together. Um, I believe. With and the, all of them are organized? Uh, well, the, the AT&T mobility, uh, it, part of the problem is that the, there's such a turnover that, you know, they come in, they find out what the job is, and they, they mm -hmm. you know, you, it's difficult to make a living, difficult to maintain. So I'm not even really sure how many people work at AT&T mobility. Um, but between the Bell South and the others, um, I, in, I, I believe it's about 300,000. And the most, and they are, for the most part, organized now. We it's mm -hmm. been a struggle, but yes. What's risen to the top as far as the issues? You know, taking our economic crisis into consideration. What are people most concerned about? Is there basic contractual uh, issues? Uh, we're not really sure because uh, I'm not really sure what the company's position is, because <laughs> uh, negotiations only started for the rest of us uh, on the uh, February 24th, last okay. Tuesday. Uh, in mobility, it is working conditions. If you go into a AT&T store, not a retailer, uh, a, um, a contractor, but an AT&T store, uh, for instance, um, there are no chairs for AT&T employees. They are not allowed to sit down. Uh, they are the standing for their eight hours, ten hours, however long they're there. Um, if they need to sit, they they uh, have to go in the back to sit. Um, they uh, uh, they are paid. Uh, a lot of it on commission and they have to make quotas. If you go on vacation, you have a monthly quota. If you take a week and go on vacation, you still have to meet your monthly quota. Regardless, it's like you were there working. So conversely, uh, if you work there, you, your odds are you're not going to take a week's vacation because you're not gonna make your quota. Uh, so uh, <laughs> even though you may have vacation time, you're gonna take long weekends because, yeah. Or, or days off during the week because you don't want to miss the big day on the weekend because that's when most of the people buy their phones. Um, so there, there's 
things like that. Uh, I mean, how, how are you going to make, if, if you're supposed to sell X amount of phones in four weeks, even if you're there for two, you have to make the same sales as if you were, were there for four. If you were sick, if you had a funeral, if you were on vacation, none of those things matter. You still have to make your quota. Wow. And th these are the types of things that, that these are why they, those negations, negotiations are contentious, and this is why uh, if you uh, can go by a, a phone, AT&T phone center store, um, let them know that you're supporting them. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, these, these people work very hard for their, for their money, and um, they're, they're trying to learn how to get, get it done. Absolutely. And, and like I said, and they're recently organized. This is their first time through this. Uh, so this is their first contract. Depends on where you were. They, they have what they call an orange contract, mm -hmm. um, which is the pamphlet, which has expired February 7th. Um, but a number of them were not part of the union till recently. There was oh, okay. uh, one, uh, I was talking to a gentleman, uh, I believe out of Florida, um, and he organized a location. And it was a week before the contract expired. Um, so there, there's, while I, I tell you that it's, mostly organized, there, mm -hmm. there's still an ongoing organizing drive. Not every store is organized. That's why not, I asked. I right, remember it's, historically that there was a lot of turnover and those difficulty in organizing right. a lot of the sites. AT&T Wireless was, was anti-union. Then Singular bought AT&T Wireless. Uh, they were union friendly. Um, or at least more friendly than other Verizon right. Wireless and some of those. In some right. circles, they're still held, upheld as the golden child of relationships exactly. between management and the union. And, and if you work for them, it's very hard to see them as union friendly. But putting that aside for a moment, to, yes. Let's ask our uh, Verizon wireless listeners um, compare your situations to uh, perhaps the <laughs> exactly. mobility side at AT and T. I think we'll see a, a very stark difference between the two. Well, going with um, it being one of the first contracts with uh, some of the mobility workers, it, it plays right into the Employee Free Choice Act and its second principle, which is trying to actually get a contract for people. Right now, there, there's really no incentive, and this is why the system as we know it's broken, for the management to settle and actually get a contract for its employees, um, at least as I know it. They'll drag out negotiations. Well, Good I, faith is a little bit um, of a non Yeah. So, uh, and we spoke earlier about the problems you might have going into a union election, National Labor Relations mm -hmm. Board election. Now. I worked in healthcare organizing before I, I went to Local 99, and I'll tell you that if you have an employer who's fighting you, fighting you every day, firing people, and they stop because they know you've <laughs> won, they just, it's not them, oh, well, now we're going to have a union. They, we'll fight them at the table. Yep. They're already putting together, you know, and, they'll fight, and, and you may end up having, you'll win with the total mandate, 75, 80% of the people voted for the union, and they'll take two years to get your first contract. If that, I you know, mean, if you run it if out, if you get a the, first contract, I believe if you run it out over the course of a year, you have the threat of being decertified. Decertified, but that's 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 rarer than it's difficult for a company to get to a decertified. It to a degree, depending on what the union well, is. Right. I'll actually, I would, I would, I would beg to differ only because uh, being from the phone, the, the Comcast. Well, and the, and the, <laughs> there you go. There, mm -hmm. there's, there's well, let, let, let's take a step back and actually define some terms because we're uh, you know a bunch of labor people talking amongst right. each other. Decertification is the process that um, workers go through to not have the union. They basically it's a reverse organizing drive. By way of not negotiating fairly and in good faith with the union, um, employers often uh, spurn on that process. Um, it just gives them an extra year of time to continue their anti-union campaign. You never have your contract, you never have your protections. That's the main thing. You might have the union, but they have no legal right to representation, which is very screwed up. I mean, people have put their necks out on the line to get the union in the first place, but you don't have a representative or a contract to uphold any basic principles on the job site. So, Well, that's exactly right. And, and you know, one of the things an employer will say over and over again, a predatory employer mm -hmm. will tell people, you know, you're not going. The union can't do anything for you, right? And then if they're going to stall at the table, they'll say, "See, nothing's happened. Nothing's changed." Legally, they can't. You don't right. have a contract exactly. defining your right to representation. Exactly. But this is there. It is the proof in the pudding. You know, they tell them 
There it is. Now, most workers, you know, if, if you do a good enough job organizing them, are savvy enough to understand what goes on. But they can stretch this out indefinitely, provided that, they, that they're able to. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, Please. My own union, I work for the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 400. We had a bargaining unit where we won overwhelmingly. You know, they wanted representation. We're now, I think it's 10 years later. We finally, we're up to the Fourth Circuit Court. We won all of our appeals to have fair bargaining. Well, guess what? No one works there anymore. That was originally in the unit. Everyone's been fired. We couldn't go into the facilities. We couldn't represent people. You know, we couldn't uphold basic principles that they were entitled to. And I say stick your neck out on the line. That's what people do because of the warped system of labor laws. And the contract, and I think by way of the Employee Free Choice Act, the real teeth in this law is getting your contract. I was just going to say that the, to me, the, mm -hmm. if, if people decide to join the union and you have an election, that's, that's just a hurdle. Mm -hmm. The race is by no means over. And one of the, the nice teeth that I see in the in employee free choice mm -hmm. is the fact that there's now a timetable. And Absolutely. if you do not come to uh, an agreement, mm -hmm. it goes to a third party and the third party uh, yeah. So it, it moves the things along, and, and that's what we need it's, to go. Um, actually, after 90 days, either party, and that's the fair portion. If you think either the union or the management isn't bargaining in good faith, you can refer it to mediation. If after another 30 days in mediation there is no resolution, you can't come to terms, it will go to bar binding arbitration. Now, this is what they're afraid of. And when they talk about the <laughs> secret ballot, they are not worried about elections. They understand nope. that they're going to lose union elections and the workers want to be in unions. They're worried about this. And they this don't want to open their books of. to a third party. And that's exactly right. right you know, and, and they know that if, that, that if they can't stall, they're going to end up with a fair union contract. Mm -hmm. It's the one thing they don't want. And yeah, it'll be a compromise, not, as all you know, binding arbitrations are. It's not, what, it's not going to be entirely what either side wants, and that's the process. But, but it gives people their basic rights in paper. In Scandinavian countries, they already do this. And the result has mm -hmm. been that people don't want to go to that problem. It's considered a failure by management and a failure by, by the union if they get to this point. Well, they also have a similar law in Canada as well, and we actually have the first collective bargaining agreement for Walmart employees. And it's a small unit, but it had to go to court and get a binding arbitration order in order to get that contract. They wouldn't bargain. And we all know Walmart about Walmart. Was, I was going to say, well, didn't they organize the butchers and then so they just closed it? Yep. They took... Walmart employees, uh, I want to say it was in Texas, they successfully organized um, the meatpacking meat facility. Right. Um, we represent with United Food and Commercial Workers the meat cutters, meatpacking plants. Walmart decided by way of not recognizing them, they would go to prepackaged meat throughout their entire division. So there are no more meat cutters. Um, they have closed stores you know, when a, a facility organizes? Well, they closed the first one in, in, in Quebec a yep. few years ago, right after they won an election. And right? that, that too, I believe, is uh, working its way through the court system. Right. So by way of Walmart, we're setting an example of one of, I'll just say the worst, um, companies when it comes to anti-union policies, and not just their unwillingness to work with a union, just their pure disdain for the pure concept of a union coming in. If Walmart were to raise the prices of every product it sells by one penny, it could have provide a living wage for every worker and have the Cadillac of health insurance plans and have a retirement system. One penny. They don't want to do it. Now let's see, why by chance would Walmart not want to provide those basic rights to their own employees? A basic living wage, affordable health insurance, a retirement system. Well, maybe it just goes back to greed. We'll talk about the employee free choice in one moment. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat.
With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is Shannon Sullivan. I'm your host this evening. Did you know that 60 million Americans would join a union if they were given the chance? The chance to join the union without intimidation or harassment now might sound like a far-fetched idea, but intimidation and harassment are things that occur every single day on union organizing drives. Actually, workers get fired in a quarter of all organizing drives. And there's been over, at least in 2005, 30,000 union organizers were fired. I'm going to play a short clip for you and we'll have a little discussion with our guests and see if this reminds you of any of your bosses and their interpretation of your rights at work. Hi, I'm Charles Bigman, CEO. I want to personally welcome you to your new job and tell you. Salary that's unique and special, just like you. In fact, your salary is based on rigorous research into your background. Race, chest size, golf handicap, smell test, and whether your dad was in my class at Princeton. Another great thing about working here is you don't have to sign a contract. All that legal mumbo jumbo and excessive paperwork guaranteeing your rights, who needs it? Well, I have a contract, but I'm the CEO. Not giving our employees a contract is great for staff motivation. The fear that you could lose your job at any moment helps keep you at your peak performance. I'd like to review a few common reasons for being fired. Please pay attention. Pregnancy, military service, getting old, getting fat, potential future pregnancy, and of course, talking about unions with your coworkers. That's a big one. You'll definitely appreciate this. Last quarter, our profit margins were through the roof. I bought the Wave Song. That's my new yacht. And I decided to give something back to my employees. A special cooler with soda. What can I say? I'm a softy. We pride ourselves on having a strong, powerful workforce. I like to call it our no wussies policy. That means no health care, sick days, paid vacation, or I just had a baby leave to distract you from work. How can you concentrate on your job if you're off sipping margaritas or in the hospital? It's impossible. We take care of our employees here. We have a first aid kit and some hand sanitizer. Mm. That always reminds me of hard work. Now, before I forget, you may have heard of a new bill in Congress called the Employee Free Choice Act. People say that could make life better for workers. Let me tell you, that's nonsense. If it becomes easier for you to form a union, then it becomes harder for me to buy one of those private islands in Dubai. You see, we're all in this company together. Thanks so much for joining the family. <laughs> now get to work. A 
little tongue-in-cheek humor there when it comes to the Employee Free Choice Act, but is it really that too far-fetched? Um, what do our bosses look at us um, in terms of our liabilities? You know, are we going to get married, get pregnant? Are we going to get fat? Are we going to get old? Everything has a little price tag on us. Our experience ends up making us a liability. I'm going to go to a couple of our guests today. We have Sean Linehan and Eamon Clifford. What's your take on our, our new job video? I like that. It's very nice. Like I said, it's, it's tongue in cheek. It's a little, uh, but by the same token, um, while it's made to seem far fetched, I really don't think it is. No. Um, dealing with employers, um, they want you in work and they don't care and they're, you know, they will divide and conquer pit one against the other. They won't give um, you chairs to sit down, it seems like. It, it wasn't that long ago that. Um, People who were out on maternity leave, they subtracted that time from their uh, time in the company. It did not count. So I know at, at AT&T we have women who uh, took maternity leave and they, they altered their seniority dates or their start dates in the company based on, uh, so that determines when they can retire. Uh, mm -hmm. They subtracted the time for their maternity leave. Um, a lot of, that has since changed, but that has, was not that long ago that that no. was changed, and it was changed in a lawsuit. Um, so, the, I mean, if, if you look at the excesses of, of corporations and their CEOs and what, you know, the, 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 uh, at AT&T, because that's what I can speak, I know that there was a CEO who had five places to live, one of which had to be a uh, grandiose penthouse in Manhattan. He had to have court-sized tickets to the Knicks. He had to have, you know, the corporate jets. The, this, this, this talk about, you know, uh, their own yachts and their own, that's mm -hmm. not that far-fetched, not at all. Not at all. And, you know, at what price tag? And a lot of the, the banks that were just bailed out with public money, where were they vacationing? Where were they holding, you know, all of these retreats for, of course, their, you know, well-funded investors. You know, it, it, it's excessive. Uh, if uh, just to, if you look at uh, Circuit City, here's a company that <laughs> store that was doing very well, and, and a few years ago decided that they were going to fire their top producers because it cost the company too much money. And they said it point blank; they were very public. We are firing you because you make too much money. They didn't right. hide the fact. No, and, and and it shows the stupidity. You're selling the people who sell the most of your product. They're making you the most money, but in the corporate mentality, you're costing me too much money. Mm -hmm. And now what's happening? They, so they, oh, but Sean, they offered them their jobs back at Christmas at minimum wage. Oh, sure. And, and, and we can see what a good corporate decision that was by all the Circuit City stores that you can go through and see 70% off, 90% off store closing. Um, but like I said, the, the corporate mentality mm -hmm. is you're costing me money. I'm going to get rid of you. Well, you know, a lot of these CEOs wear these downsizing and restructuring as a badge of honor. They go, it's a great, there was an article in, in the New York Times a few months ago about how this is this great badge of honor for these guys to say, you know, I cut all these jobs. I'm meaner and leaner. I'm only going to make one dollar in salary. Right, yeah. What about all their options? Exactly, you know. Oh, is it, and it, Randall Stevenson, CEO, and I'm sorry to keep on bringing up AT&T, but his big thing is the management is not getting a bonus this year. Oh. And, they're, and they're not, of course, he doesn't say how many millions he got in dividends in January by, out of, part of the 9.6 billion that they paid out in dividends, I believe his portion was two mm -hmm. or three million. So yeah. uh, if you want to give me two or three million in dividends, I, I think I can forego a bonus for one year. It's big as it is. It's Man. just the kind of guy I might be. <laughs> well, I, I will be remiss if we don't hit upon the third element of the Employee Free Choice Act, which is, again, puts teeth back in labor law, which has been non-existent for 70 years. Um, it allows for penalties when there are, as you know, you have filed unfair labor practices. There are uh, individuals that are fired for union activities, whether in the organizing or the contractual campaigns. Um, it makes it so if these are illegally done, um, the individual receives triple back pay, and there is a $20,000 fine attached to that. Now, right now, as we've discussed previously, they get their back pay minus their interim earnings. This may 
no, I don't know the corporate mindset entirely, actually give a company second thought when they say they're going to fire your, their union organizing leader. What do you think, Eamon? Well, I would hope so. I mean, the bottom line is that there is no penalty, mm -hmm. no penalty on the employer at this point. And it, it's a, to call it a miscarriage of justice is an insult to other miscarriages of justice. Yeah. It, it, is un, it is unbelievable that you can do that to somebody. You've mentioned that you knew people who lost their home. We've had the same thing mm -hmm. happen, obviously. And you won't meet a union organizer who's done this for a while, who hasn't met somebody who, who got fired for putting their neck on the line. A got quarter fired for of calling. all organizing drives. Now, it's interesting, though. You, know, you think of firing a leader, and a lot of times they won't fire the leader. They find somebody even more vulnerable. Who's a pregnant woman involved, peripherally involved, in, in the organizing drive? They fire them. It destroys, there's people who never got their lives back, and, and there's no penalty on the employer. And like I said, even at this point, even the back wages are written off as a loss. So there's no, there's no sanction on the employer. There's no reason for them not to do that. Now, conversely, there are sanctions on unions, for in, and there should be, for inappropriate Absolutely. activity. But n no such mm -hmm. sanction on the employer. And I so, think what all of the three points of the Employee Free Choice are trying to address is a general equity throughout the system. Let's just even the playing field. Let's make it so that people have the basic right, if they want to join the union, to be able to do so. And the most expedient method by signing a card, if that is their choice. Let's not put all the power in the employer's hands to delay so by way they can intimidate and harass and try to get around actually having a contract. Let's make it so that people get what they ultimately deserve, which is that piece of paper, that contractually binding agreement with their company, something a CEO would never go without in their own hands. Now, one of the funny things is you hear from the people who are against card check mm -hmm. over and over again, the card check will destroy the right to a secret ballot but companies choose to go with card check all the time. Yes, it's not I mean, a all method. the time. I, we, they're employers we've never dealt with, and they look around and say, "Well, this you know, local 99 has over 200 contracts in the metropolitan area. We might as well stand for a card check with them." And they'll come in and stand mm -hmm. for a card check. We always give an employer an option. We write them a letter. And in fact, if I was to f file for a petition today with the National Labor Relations Board for an election, the first thing the board agent would do would would, would ask me. Well, did you ask him for recognition? Did you ask him for a card check? And, yeah, and, and we're required to so do. I mean, so it, card check exists now. It, it's simply not the choice of the workers. It's the choice of their boss. Which, and it should be, in the hands of the workers. So exactly. thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Sean. And I also want to thank Senators Warner and Senators Webb, Congressman Moran and Congressman Connolly, who have uh, expressed, and some of them co-signed, for the Employee Free Choice Act. We know that you stand with us for providing equity for our workers in a fairer legal system and labor laws. Thank you so much for joining us.